right. I am so glad to be here. This is fantastic. Now, to Dr. Barnard, because he was kind enough to give you guys a break, all kidney doctors, we appreciate it when you go use the restroom. <laughs> so thank you. And if you're drinking water, we appreciate it as well. So thank you again. So with that, let me go ahead and get started. I'm going to try to tell you a little about a subject that is not talked about a lot. And I love quotes. This is my favorite quote. I know everybody in here loves their favorite quote, and this is probably it. So please, pick a different quote. <laughs> this is mine. So, so what's interesting about nutrition and kidney disease is it's probably the most confusing topic. I get patients coming back to me and say, Doc, I went to see your dietitian, and he or she said, you can't eat this, 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 this. Then I went to see my diabetic dietitian, and she said the complete opposite. So now I'm totally confused. And if you have somebody on dialysis, well, basically, forget it, you can't eat anything. <laughs> so what is the truth, and why should you care? The reason this matters so much is while we're talking about heart disease, Alzheimer's, dementia, kidney disease is one of those things that we always forget. It matters. Since the 1980s, when we finally had ACE inhibitors, nothing has been discovered in the field of kidney disease. It's the same medications, and it's the same dietary advice. And as a result, the mortality in kidney disease is the same. We see that essentially one in five people on dialysis end up dying every single year. 20% mortality every single year on dialysis. Five years, your risk of death on dialysis is 50%. 50. And that, my friends, has not changed at all. So let's take a look at what is the data. But before we get there, what's so interesting about kidney disease, unlike any other disease, when you're having a heart attack, you know it. You feel like an elephant crushing your chest. What happens when you're having kidney disease? There's nothing. Right? There are no symptoms to kidney disease. As a result, most people who have kidney disease never know it. In fact, I'll have people come into my office who just felt tired, and they're on the verge of death. That's how crazy kidney disease is. And that's why it matters for everyone in this room to understand it. And if you think you're immune to it, you may not even know, because one in seven people out there actually have kidney disease, and they don't even know it. That's why this becomes so interesting. And what's even more remarkable is the three main causes, the two biggest ones are diabetes and high blood pressure, but the third one is weight. That hasn't changed. And while we talk about all of the organs, let me tell you, everything eventually leads down to the kidneys. Everything. Literally. So what's interesting about this stuff is kidney disease is probably one of those diseases that is very discriminatory. It's not an equal opportunity player. What it does is it treats people differently. If you're Caucasian, you have a much lower risk than somebody who's African American. African Americans have a remarkably higher risk. In fact, almost four times higher risk than being Caucasian. What about Native Americans, Asians, Hispanics? But the reason I'm here today to talk to you about this topic is not because of statistics. It's because this is the one disease that ends up killing more people than breast or prostate cancer. Yet we don't end up talking about this as much, and we should. So that's why it's time to start that conversation. So with that, what I want to take you through is a lot of data. This is what I do for a living, and this is what I do not for a living, because I'm one of those guys who likes to sit in Starbucks and read studies. I get really excited. So that's why I'm going to show you all this wonderful stuff. I have a nutrition talk that I give that I review studies every single year, and same thing for this. I review studies every single year, and my wife always wonders, what do you do all day? I say, well, I, I, I go read studies in Starbucks. So, so for those of you guys who know my wife, please tell her that's what I do. That's all I do. All right, so with that, I'm going to take you through the data on all this wonderful stuff. And there's a lot of information. And I'm trying to find the best positioning so I can see the timer, too. But what I'm going to do for you guys is go a little bit fast, because there really is a lot of data. You guys have access to all of these slides already. So don't worry about the data. 
at the end, I'm going to summarize everything for you. I'll bring it together with a take-home message that you can take it with you for yourself, for your family, for your patients, so you can start using this right away. So with that, let's start the fun stuff. So let's talk about salt, right? Salt is very interesting because when you tell a patient to go cut down their salt, what do they do? They go home, they say, you know, honey, I'm going to put away the salt shaker. Well, the typical American consumes between 3.6 grams to 5 grams of sodium per day. So when they cut out the salt shaker, they cut up about 7 to 10 percent of what they take in. And then they come back to you and their blood pressure hasn't changed. And then, to make matters worse, there's a couple of studies that came out, and everybody from Time Magazine, once Time puts it on something, it must be important, but everybody from Time Magazine to you name it, said, you know what, salt doesn't matter anymore. It's not linked. Therefore, you don't have to worry about it. And they say, wait a second, nutrition is an ugly science because we don't do randomized control studies. That's not true. I'm going to show you tons of randomized studies to show you that we have very clear data around this. So what's the data on salt? Very simple. I'm focusing on kidney disease, so today it's all about the kidneys, right? This is my 15 minutes of fame for my kidneys, both of them. So with that, what's the data? It's very interesting. Because we said blood pressure is the biggest thing that contributes along with diabetes, what happens if you actually have people who can restrict their salt intake. Well, very interesting. If you increase your salt intake by just about a gram, you will raise your risk of high blood pressure by as much as 26%. How about the opposite? What if your patients actually listen to you? And by the way, with my patients, I'm sure you guys are different. Your patients never tell you this. My patients tell me, Doc, I never eat salt. <laughs> and I exercise all day. In fact, <laughs> I walk 10 miles every day. So I say, you know, I believe you and thank you. And then I do a 24-hour urine collection where I measure how much salt that they put out in the urine and that's how I know how much salt that they truly eat. So I actually do this and that's how I can tell you when they follow a low sodium diet and how dramatic it is. So what happens if you restrict their sodium? Something remarkable happens. The impact is equivalent to you giving them a blood pressure medication. That's why you should care about salt. But maybe you're like, hey, you know what, that's all fine and done, but we know that protein in the urine is the biggest risk factor for your kidneys getting worse. So if you want to know somebody who has kidney disease, how fast they're going to progress to dialysis, measure protein in the urine, right? That's how you tell. So if you measure protein in the urine, you find that if you restrict their salt intake, their protein in the urine goes down dramatically. So what about ACE inhibitors? We talked about the 80s, right? And some people are still in the 80s, but 80s were awesome. And for kidney doctors, that was like the only time we had some exciting news for everybody because we got a brand new class of drugs, which were ACE inhibitors, right? So when you looked at proteinuria and you gave somebody an ACE inhibitor, you had a reduction. But this is 2011. By the way, it's, it's interesting, right? Medicine changes all the time. So in 2011, we were still giving ACEs and ARBs. And I'm using a lot of mnemonics because I figured everybody in here is in the health profession, but this is just a class of medications that we have. And we know better, right? Combining the two of them is a bad idea. You should not do it. If you're doing it, I'm not judging. Just stop it. <laughs> okay. So what happens with the ACE inhibitors and ARBs is, yeah, you get maybe a better reduction. But what happens if you put them on a sodium restriction along with an ACE, right? This is what happens. You get a 50% reduction in how much protein they're spilling. So when you have your patients who are diabetic with diabetic nephropathy spilling all that protein in the urine and you keep adding ACE on ACE on ACE and then add spironolactone or something else like another aldosterone antagonist and you say, wow, now their potassium is too high and I can't do anything. Don't forget the salt. Salt matters. And by the way, we were bad people in 2011. We did this. I don't know what happened to the people. I'm sure they're alive. But we're not combining ACEs with ARBs. I just like the fact that just a simple thing as cutting down their sodium matters. And everybody in here who follows a whole foods plant-based diet, should you worry about sodium ever? No. You don't have to think about it, right? That's the beauty of changing things around is if you just change the way you eat, 
you don't have to do this. Now, what about restricting sodium and chronic kidney disease? Well, if you restrict sodium in chronic kidney disease, in the Cochrane meta-analysis, you find once again what? Blood pressure goes down, protein goes down. And why should you care? Because if you're in the health profession, you have to understand how much dialysis costs. It costs anywhere between 100,000 to 140,000 per patient per year. And that's not even counting hospitalizations. If you're on PD or peritoneal dialysis, yes, it's cheaper. That's the economic cost. What's the emotional cost? Can you put a price on that? Do you know how much people suffer? You know what we say when a person goes through dialysis? We say it's like running a marathon. They just ran a marathon. And they go home and they're so tired and fatigued. And because the bath has sodium, they're so darn thirsty. And then the nephrologist yells at them and says, why did you eat salt? Well, gosh darn it, I just had this craving. Why did you drink water? Well, I was thirsty. And then they go home and sleep and they're so tired and by the time they get energy again, it's time for dialysis. That's the human cost. That's the reason why things like what we eat make such a difference. So when you look at the data and somebody comes and tells you that you don't need to worry about salt intake anymore, let me tell you to the contrary and let me show you hundreds of studies that say the exact opposite. Now, let's look at what happens if you do this. All you're going to get is a lower risk of death and a lower risk of dialysis. Potassium is very interesting. In our kidney patients, and by the way, do I have any fellow nephrons in here? Any nephrologist? See, when you're a nephrologist, we don't say you're a nephrologist. That's not cool. We say you're a nephron, <laughs> right? It's just, it's one of those hip things. I'm with the hip crowd. So, if you're not a nephron, we forgive you. It's okay. All right. So what's, and, and, and you know the, the difference between cardiologist and nephrologist is? We have two organs. Okay. Bad joke. All my fellow cardiologists, I love you all. So potassium is very interesting, right? We have our kidney patients, and what do we tell our kidney patients? We tell them if you eat potassium, you're going to die. Right? So we make it so that you can't have anything. If it's got fruits, if it's got vegetables, don't eat it, whole grains, don't eat it, legumes, don't eat it. Well, what the heck are you going to eat? Oh yeah, here's all the red meat because your albumin is going to be low. So here's what's so interesting. There's a thing called a blood test. Now I don't know about you, it wasn't invented yesterday, but we can check if your potassium is okay. And if you're having a banana a day and your potassium is okay, do you really need to stop the banana? This is why when doctors give blanket statements, it's so difficult. So what I do with my patients is, if they're eating green leafy vegetables, it's okay. You know, the classic example is Coumadin. We tell our patients on Coumadin, don't have green leafy vegetables. What kind of, I don't want to use certain words, what kind of a crazy statement is that? If you eat a salad every day at the same time, the same amount, our Coumadin doc, uh, clinic staff can adjust your Coumadin dose to it. But instead, to make it easier for ourselves, we tell them, hey, just don't. Same thing applies to potassium. So there's no blanket statement that says no. High potassium will stop your heart and kill you, right? That's a fact. But at the same time, if we watch what you're doing and your potassium's okay, then that is not an absolute restriction. It's checking the blood test and for healthcare providers, doing what we're supposed to do. So, what's interesting about people who are healthy, though, is if you supplement potassium in their diets, their blood pressure goes down. Do you need to supplement potassium in their diets? No, right? All you need to do is have an avocado, have melons, have bananas, have oranges, right? Have tomatoes, have all of this rich, good stuff that already has potassium. And if you're eating lots of colors in your diet, you never have to think about potassium, and as a result, your blood pressure will go down, right? Versus you can eat all the meat you want and your blood pressure will never go down. There's a difference in how we look at things. And what about potassium intake and chronic kidney disease? Well, if you have the lowest intake versus the highest intake, the people who get the lowest intake of potassium is people who follow 
the SAD diet, the standard American diet, what happens to them? They have a 44% increase, increased risk of new chronic kidney disease. Calcium. Now, now, this is like my pet peeve, right? Everybody's obsessed with calcium. It's like, oh my God, there are supplements for calcium. Everything is fortified with calcium. It's like calcium is about to go out of stock. <laughs> we must put calcium in our bodies, right? But what's the data? So it's fascinating when we look at calcium, especially, now remember, I'm talking more about kidney disease, but here's what's interesting is, is right? What I don't understand about what we do is if we look at outside of the United States and we look at places in the world, such as the blue zones, where their food intake is predominantly plant-based, not American plant-based, it's whole foods plant-based, we find that they have some of the lowest rates of osteoporosis. Yet when we look over here in the United States and we look at the SAD diet and we look at the net acid load, we leach out all the calcium phosphorus from the bones, we cause all this damage from the acid intake, and then we try to say, well, let's just undo what we did by giving you some more calcium. It does not work that way. Just like if you have a cheeseburger, you can't just go on the treadmill and work it off. It doesn't work that way. So what's the data on calcium in kidney disease? This is fascinating. It's a really small trial, but it goes to a really important point. When they gave these guys, it's only 12 people in the trial, 800 milligrams a day of calcium, what they found was fine. Nothing happened. It was negative to neutral. Now, they gave these guys two grams of calcium. And then they looked at their blood calcium levels. And what they found was that the blood calcium level did not, did not go up. Okay, interesting. But here's where it gets really interesting. Then they said, well, where did the calcium go? So they first measured the stool. And of course, when you have to measure things like the stool, you have to be very scientific, so you ask interns. So they found some interns and they said, go measure the stool. And what they found was there was no extra calcium in the stool. So nothing changed in their GI absorption. Then they measured the urine, right? And when they measured the urine, they found out there was no extra calcium in the urine. So, didn't go out in the stool, didn't go out in the urine, wasn't in the blood. Where the heck was it? Well, it's very easy. It ended up in the tissues. If you look at our patients on dialysis and you do a chest x-ray, you know they light up like a Christmas tree. You can see all of their blood vessels calcified. In fact, we have some of the worst calcifications in our dialysis patients. And it's because you get calcium and you get phosphorus and they do this wonderful thing called precipitation. They go and deposit everywhere in the body. So that leads me to phosphorus. All right, so here's the thing. People are like, I need phosphorus to live. You know how little phosphorus you need because phosphorus is part of ATP and if you don't have it, your diaphragm can't contract and you can't breathe and you die, right? But I have news for everybody. You're going to die anyways. <laughs> so stop worrying about the low phosphorus because everybody in this room has to worry about high phosphorus. Why? Because phosphorus is very interesting. Is, is As phosphorus goes up, this is in healthy people, your risk of death goes up 18%. The more you eat in phosphorus, the more your death risk increases. So. Phosphorus comes in a variety of different forms, but the two that I want you to remember, and this is probably the most important thing I'm going to tell you today, is there's inorganic and there's organic. And what is the difference between the two? Well, inorganic, the issue with inorganic is it goes directly into your blood, 100%. That's all you folks who love those processed foods. That's your patients who love those processed foods. That's all your pre-cooked meals. That's things like cheese. And that's things like sodas. And by the way, diet sodas are no different, right? So 100% absorption. But now, if you had a choice, you should always pick organic phosphate, right? It's the lesser of two evils. Now, this is not organic foods, not the same thing, right? I don't even know why they call foods organic because it confuses me. I'm a science guy. What does that mean? So organic phosphate, what's interesting is, is its absorption is a lot less. What are the sources? Well, there's plant sources and there's animal sources, but it doesn't stop there. So you know cheese is bad, you know soft drinks, sodas are bad, 
But now let's get into animal versus plant-based sources of phosphorus. Why should you care? Animal absorption is about 60% in the gut. But now look at what happens with plants. If you go to plant-based sources, you have 50% reduction. How fascinating is that? In fact, this gets even more interesting, right? If you go into looking at people who are omnivores or meat eaters versus vegetarians, you will find vegetarians always have lower amounts of phosphorus. High phosphorus is linked to mortality in study after study after study. Now, in dialysis patients, we talk about something known as the phosphorus to protein ratio. Why do we do that? Because it sounds cool. But what it is, is we want a product that's lowest in phosphorus and highest in protein. Because when you're on dialysis, you're in a catabolic, high inflammatory state. And the darn machine takes some of your albumin out. So you're losing protein through the machine, and you're breaking down muscle, and you're breaking down protein, and you have all this inflammation in the body. So we know that if your serum albumin or your blood albumin levels get low, you have a dramatic, linear, rise in mortality. And that's why we make such an emphasis on making sure people's albumins are okay that we tell them to go get a burger and bring it with them to the dialysis machine. Not only are we going to dialyze you, we're going to ensure that you're a repeat customer. <laughs> so look at this ratio. Now, this is really small, right? You probably can't see it. Don't worry about it. It's okay. I did that on purpose. You can't ask any questions if you can't see. <laughs> But I just want to show you, look at cheese versus lentils, right? And if you look at the protein, I'm sorry, the phosphorus to protein ratio, you find that both are exactly the same. So one might say, hey, go have a lot of cheese. But what's the difference? The difference is absorption of that phosphorus. Why would you want to have the lentils? Because you have half the absorption. In fact, I would argue, unlike this study, I would argue that it's actually more than half. That's why plant-based sources, especially plant-based sources of protein, are so cool. Now, speaking of protein, everybody's obsessed with protein, right? It's crazy. You know, I was watching last night, I, I was back in my room, and there's this show, and I was like flipping the channels, and I get to National Geographic, and they had this show called Naked and Afraid. <laughs> so they take these people, they make them naked, and they put them in like the wilderness, right? in like out in some jungle somewhere, and all they have to do is survive for 21 days. And the person who's there is like, oh my God, you know, I gotta have protein. Like, <laughs> I'm eating these berries and all this stuff, but you know, the reason I feel so tired is I gotta have protein. And what's remarkable about that, it's like the best weight loss experiment, because what's crazy is people go in, right, they have these big guts and all that stuff. 21 days later, they come out and they're lean and they're muscular and they got these veins popping and it's amazing. I'm like, wow, we should do that to everybody. <laughs> right? I just loved that show last night. I was telling my wife, I'm like, this is so crazy. She's like, what are you watching? I'm like, I'm hooked. It's like midnight. And they had just one show after another and I just couldn't stop. And I kept hearing, we got to have protein. We got to have, like, wow, if there was ever an endorsement. So the, the data on protein is very interesting. The standard protein requirement is 0.8 grams per kilogram per day, 0.8, right? It's not 1.2, it's not two grams per pound, right? According to bodybuilders, none of that stuff is, is real because all of that stuff is gonna filter through your kidneys and it's gonna destroy your kidneys. So what's the data? It's very interesting is, is if you restrict somebody's protein, by the way, this is back in 2009, it was a meta-analysis, and what they found was that if you could get somebody to go down to 0.6, what you would find is that their risk of death would go down by 32% simply by putting them on a low-protein diet. By the way, they also had a very low-protein diet arm. They just couldn't succeed in that because people got malnourished. I will show you another study, which is very recent, that had an ingenious way of overcoming that. So very low protein diet also works really, really well. Hold that thought though. Now, why does this matter? Because the number needed to treat was anywhere between two to 56. If you just treated just a few of your patients on a low protein diet, you can have such a dramatic reduction in their risk of going on to dialysis and their risk of developing kidney disease that progresses and death. Now, in non-diabetics, what happens? 
same thing, low protein diet, 33% reduction. Insulin dependent diabetics, 44% reduction in protein in the urine. How cool is that by giving them low protein? By the way, I see so many doctors tell their patients, you know, Mr. Smith, you're spilling a lot of protein in the urine. Go eat more protein. That's wrong, right? I know it makes intuitive sense. You're losing, so you got to fill it, but it's not like your checking account. It doesn't work the same way. So you have to think differently about this. So source. Source matters because if you give people animal protein versus non-animal protein, animal protein increases how much protein you spill. We don't understand the mechanism, but we do believe it has to do with net acid excretion. How much acid you put in your body, therefore how much acid you're kicking out through the kidneys. And if you switch it, you give somebody whole grains, what happens? You get the opposite effect. You get a dramatic reduction. So not only do you want to give them a low protein diet, what else do you want to do? You want to go ahead and make sure that the type of protein is plant-based, not animal-based. Then what about looking at another source? So here we go. Looking at it in women specifically, what happens is if women get lots of animal protein, their rate of decline of kidney function. By the way, this is really interesting, and I know it sounds morbid, but we're friends, right? So I can say this. Do you know the moment you're born, like kidneys-wise, you're really dying, right? So you start off with about a million kidney cells in each kidney, and all that happens is we lose them. That's all that happens. So it's a race. Our job as nephrons or kidney specialists is to slow down the rate of kidney function decline. We can't stop it. That happens to everybody as we get older. So what we find is, is that on average, people's rate of kidney function decline may be about 0.5 or so in terms of GFR decline. But when you have kidney disease, it can be 1, 1.52. And that's what we're trying to decline is how fast your kidneys go down. Now, what happens with soy protein? Soy is actually remarkably beneficial for kidney disease. In fact, it is one of the best protein sources you can have if you have kidney disease. So when we look at it, what we find is if you have animal protein versus soy, with animal protein, you actually have an increase in filtration rate. Why should you care? Don't you want more stuff to filter through the kidneys? The answer is actually no, because what happens is when you're a diabetic, what is the first thing that happens to your kidneys? Do they shrink or do they get larger? They actually get larger. And that doesn't mean it's because they're performing better. It means there's so much pressure, we call it hyperfiltration, but so much pressure that they start to get larger, 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 and then they start to die. And that's when the kidneys start to shrink. So if you do a kidney ultrasound on a patient and their kidneys are large and they're diabetic, that is the best time to intervene. That is the time you have to be extremely aggressive, not when their kidneys are already shrinking. Red meat and chronic kidney disease, same exact thing, right? Higher risk of kidney disease if you have highest amount of red meat. Same thing in total protein. If you got total protein, highest versus lowest total protein, or if you just look at red meat, you have a significantly higher risk of developing not just chronic kidney disease, but going on to kidney failure or dialysis. And then what's interesting is, is you know, there's a lot of people who can't give up certain types of food. If they're not ready to change, what I do with them is I love BJ Fogg's work on habits and how little steps make all the difference. So I always talk about just give me one serving less. One serving of red meat can have such a dramatic effect as far as lowering your risk goes. Now, I talked about very low protein diet. This was a remarkable study because in it, what they ended up doing was using an extremely low protein diet, 0.3 grams per kilogram per day, and they wanted to make sure these guys didn't get malnourished, so they gave them keto analogs of the essential amino acids. And this way, once the essential amino acids went in your body, they separated and you got your regular stuff. So they did not get malnourished. But what was interesting was endpoints were 50% reduction in kidney function or going on dialysis. And what did they find? The arm with the low protein diet, only 13% of them met the endpoint criteria versus the arm who was in the regular uh, part where they were getting low protein but not the vegetarian side.
So the very low protein arm, only 13%, the low protein arm, 42%. So what this tells you is not only does very low protein work better, but the type of protein makes a huge and substantial difference in all of this. And the number needed to treat was only about five. Just five people. That's all it takes to put them on a vegetarian diet and to tell them, just don't obsess about protein, and that's it. You don't have to say, you need to eat exactly this many ounces. Listen, nobody cares. I've never seen a person at a restaurant take out a measuring scale and really measure, weigh how much they were eating. So nobody cares. All they will care about is simple advice. Don't obsess over protein. Type of protein matters. Stick to plant sources. Now, uremic toxins is what we worry about because those are the ones that cause all of this oxidative stress. And when you eat protein, your gut bacteria, once again, the gut microbiome, especially when it comes to kidneys, is huge. But the gut microbiome will go ahead and create these toxins. And what we find is, is in general, in general, vegetarians have far lower rates of indoxyl sulfate, p sulfate, than omnivores do. So if you have somebody on the verge of dialysis, what is one of the best things you can do right now is change what they eat. Carnitine, we know about carnitine, but what's interesting about carnitine, and I know speakers have already mentioned it, but here's the kidney twist. So carnitine, when it goes inside your gut, there's a, a sort of a middle of the pathway where you get gamma butyrobutane, then you get trimethylamine, and then finally in your blood you get trimethylamine and oxide. TMAO is linked to things like heart failure, stroke, heart disease. But what people forget is it also causes your kidneys to fail faster. And what's fascinating about it is, is when you have increased amounts of TMAO inside your blood, for some reason, the kidneys downregulate the clearance and they actually clear it out less. The more kidneys you have, I'm sorry, the more kidney disease you have, the less TMAO you secrete out of the kidneys, which means the more it stays in your blood. It's a vicious cycle. And red meat, rich in carnitine, plays a huge part in all of this. Soy protein, we talked about this. It's a really elegant trial, but basically what they did was they took some of the animal protein versus plant-based protein, but then they took some of that animal protein and switched some of it with soy. So the, really the only thing that changed was soy protein. And what they found was remarkable. Remember, we use BUN or blood urea nitrogen as a marker of toxins that we can't measure, right? And so what we found was that there's this dramatic reduction in urine, urea nitrogen, dramatic reduction in protein in the urine, and even their serum phosphorus went lower than it would have if you just did all vegetable protein. So soy protein actually makes a dramatic difference. Now saturated fat, everybody keeps talking about saturated fat. It's all over the news. You know, there's this study that everybody read called the PURE trial, which all of a sudden came out and said saturated fat is back. And if anybody has read the trial, you know how many issues we had with it. So the fascinating part is, is we say we don't have good data on saturated fat. We do. And the data is, is that your risk of albumin in the urine goes up dramatically. And if you reduce it, your cardiovascular events go down. Now, fiber, what's interesting about fiber is, is increase it. That's it. That's all there is. And if you increase it, your risk of kidney disease goes down dramatically. So what we know about fiber is, is that no matter how you look at it, eating more fiber matters. And by the way, everybody who's a big fan of things like the paleo diet and everything, listen, I think it's great to be paleo but not the definition of paleo that people believe. So what's interesting is our ancestors were not hunters and gatherers. They were gatherers, and if they got lucky, they were hunters. That's number one. Number two is their average fiber intake was not our fiber intake of 10 grams. It was more like 80 to 100 grams. So yes, we should be more like our paleo in those regards of eating more fiber because it will lower your all-cause mortality and it will lower your risk of kidney disease. Now, sugar is fascinating because we love sugar, but what the data shows is if you become a pre-diabetic or diabetic, your risk of having protein in the urine goes up dramatically. And if you look at kidney disease, your risk of kidney disease incident goes up dramatic the more sugar you end up taking. But wait a second, let me skip this and go to artificial sweeteners because everybody who thinks diet soda, right, they'll go to McDonald's, get a Big Mac meal and get a diet soda. 
because it makes a difference. So what happens, it's very interesting. You get your diet drinks or artificial sweeteners and your risk goes up dramatically. Now, what about diet sodas and risk of end-stage renal disease? Same exact thing. Look at how dramatic the risk is with artificial sweeteners and why? It's because if you take artificial sweeteners, what ends up happening is, is we know that it causes you to eat more of your meal than if you just had the regular sugar drink. When you have a sweetener that's as much as 20,000 times sweeter than sugar, that's addictive. And you're going to crave that. It's like sending an alcoholic into a bar and telling him or her, don't drink the alcohol. It doesn't work. So everybody who switches to artificial sweeteners, you're fooling yourself in that. So let me bring all this stuff together in the next few slides in terms of diet. So what's interesting is, to me, the definition of a Mediterranean diet is a whole foods, plant-based diet, plus some stuff. Right? That's what it is. So then, what does it tell you? The closer you get to it, the more dramatic you have a reduction in kidney disease. DASH is similar. What is DASH? It's very similar to a Mediterranean diet, so it is a whole foods, plant-based diet, plus some other stuff. And what do you find? The lowest people who stick to a DASH diet, they have the highest risk when it comes to chronic kidney disease. Right? Now let's look at a plant-based diet. By the way, the reason I put this one, it's a really new study, but two was it makes a point. And the point is this. There is a healthy plant-based diet, and then there is the unhealthy plant-based diet. And now with the advent of, you know, years ago when we were talking about nutrition, Nobody understood what it meant to say the word plant-based diet. Now, everybody's using the word. I mean, Carl's Jr. is using the word. You're like, what is going on? And you know, they know nothing about plant-based diets. So there's a healthy plant-based diet, which dramatically lowers your risk, and then there's the unhealthy version. And what is that, right? Potato chips is not part of our whole foods plant-based diet. So remember this, when you look at all of these new products that are incredibly processed coming out on the market, they are not good for you, right? Nature gave you the food, your job is to eat it, right? Not to manipulate it in 30 different ways. So bottom line, it's very simple. If there's one message I can give you for your diabetic patients, for your heart patients, for your kidney patients, is that, that's it. Just eat food, not too much, mostly plants, right? That's all there is to it. And here's the bottom line. It's in your slide deck. Please see it. All my slides are there for you guys. I am out of time. I want to thank you guys for being so gracious with me and allowing me this opportunity. Okay, to take a couple, okay, question. Hi, I'm, I'm an internist from San Francisco. So I see many patients mm -hmm. <laughs> taking, uh, consuming smoothies with protein powders. And I inevitably see their BUN significantly elevated and at which time I can convince them to stop the protein powder and eat real food. But have there been any studies linking protein powders to uh, kidney disease, and are there any references that I can help, and what, your, what are your thoughts about these protein powders that many Americans are consuming? So great question. The question is around protein powders, and, in, and specifically, is there any references? The answer is absolutely. You know, the biggest issue with protein powders is how they're extracted, and we worry about use of hexanes and so forth. And then, when you look at the data, so there's a few things, Consumer Reports had a study, where they looked at the levels of mercury, cadmium, lead, arsenic, inside protein powders, and how high they are. Remember, just because it says they adopt good manufacturing practices, it doesn't mean the FDA ever checks on them, number one. Number two, you don't need protein powders and be very careful about which protein powders, even if they say, because it's very expensive to test them. So I don't recommend protein powders for anybody, including my dialysis patients. Wow. I, I like this group right here. I know that we can go a long time before we die if we don't eat for a while. We can go, we can go 40, 30, I mean, depending on our fat, our, um, what we're carrying. However, we can only go a few days without water. And yet, as a nephron, you haven't mentioned how important water is. Could you please comment on that? 
Sure. So water is important, but I also think that the data around water is overblown. And the reason is this. So everybody's heard of eight ounces, eight glasses of water a day. You know that's complete false, right? And the reason that's complete false is everybody who read the 1960s study, they forgot to read the second sentence. And what was the second sentence after they said that? It was that the majority of water comes from the food you eat. And what has water? Fruits, vegetables, everything that we tell you to eat in this conference already has lots of water. If you're thirsty, drink water. If you're elderly, drink a little bit more water. But in terms of prescription, we don't really have an accurate uh, assessment of being able to tell you. And contrary to popular belief, drinking a gallon a day will not make your kidneys any better. Oops. And I think I'm out of time. Keep going. Okay. One more question. Yes, please. I have one quick question. So um, I was eating dinner with my friends the other day, and I was talking to them about the plant-based diet. And then my PhD pharmacist friend had to mention how, oh, you know, if you're a guy, you have to be careful with the soy protein since it has phytonutrients. And my response was basically, you know, if you're going to be concerned about the um, the phytoestrogens in soy, then you'd be more concerned with the estrogenic effects of meat and chicken, you know, with feminization and breast enlargement and all that. So. But I didn't, but I couldn't go on, so I wanted, I wanted some help. Can you help me with, with uh, I don't know if I can help you, but <laughs> I, I got to tell you, I'm really worried because I eat tofu every day. So maybe I have to be scared and concerned. No, there's nothing wrong with it. I showed you the data. When it comes to soy protein, in fact, for kidneys, it's probably one of the best proteins there is. And in terms of my regular nutrition research, I've looked at it. There's nothing there. And if you talk about, yeah, soy is GMO, well, guess what? Everything is GMO, right? If you look at the wheat crop itself, look at the wheat crop 60 years ago and today, what did we do to it? We kept inbreeding it to try to make the stock smaller, the germ bigger. So we have to be careful in how much fear-mongering we do. We're all going to die, right? <laughs> at least we can try to be good human beings, create social connections, create love, sleep more, move more, love more, and eat plants. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs>